Uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here. Shall we give all the mothers a round of applause? Although I think they deserve a lot more than a applause. So much, so much they have done for, for us. You know, all of us, we have mothers um, um, as well as our children, right? Those of us who are, uh, who, who are you know, who have kids. Um, right, uh, before uh, I start, uh, maybe join me in a word of prayer. Dear God, uh, we're thankful for everything that you've given us. Thank you, God, for ministering to our hearts uh, through the songs that the, the, the youth uh, led us today. Uh, so happy to see uh, them just wanting to worship you with, with, their, with their words, with their songs, with their music. So happy, Father, that, um, you know, you, you through, through uh, you know, uh, chats, uh, words, uh, sharing uh, through, through all the tears uh, her, her life, um, that, that also touch our hearts and, and, and really prepare us, Father, to, to, to hear your word, Father. Pray, Father, that you will use uh, my words uh, to, to explain, Father, your plan uh, for each and every one of us in our lives, Father, and uh, your grand plan, Father, to, uh, for our future as well, God. Thank you, God, for, for the Bible that inspires us pray, Father, that you really, really speak to every one of our hearts and help us, Father, to, to be inspired and uh, to go away uh, really learning something, Father. Thank you so much, God, for everything. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so the theme for today's lesson is, is on work, as the title suggests. And I'm, I'm supposed to continue from the book of Colossians, which uh, we Kyung started last week. Um, so yes, I, I will talk about uh, Colossians, but I will depart a little from the usual, uh, you know, verse by verse kind of uh, expository uh, teaching, because I think in the last few, uh, uh, last two series that we've gone through, uh, ep the episodes of uh, Ephesians and Philippians, we've done quite a bit of that. So today's lesson is more topical, um, but it will be f the central verse will be a verse in the in in the book of Colossians. Uh, some of you may already know what verse I'm referring to. Most of what I'm going to share uh, are ideas from various uh, lessons that I heard, uh, articles and books I've read about book uh, about work, such as um, the book by Tim Keller, "Every Good Endeavor." It's not a new book, but it's an excellent book uh, that you know tells us in depth about what work really means to God and to us. So just a taster because we don't have a lot of time. I'm hoping that this will give us some food for thought. And uh, as we pray and we search for the meaning of work uh, in our lives, this, this activity uh, that we devote much of our waking hours to, right? Right, so first question, what is work to us? Work are commonly known as, referred to as job or occupation, or vocation, or even career, and some other words like maybe profession and things like that. To different people, uh, it represents different things. We may think through a really practical lens, uh, working or having a job brings in money for us to pay for our bills and to provide for ourselves and our families which is definitely God's plan. Okay? We should work with our hands and provide for, for our families. Um, but of course, we prefer that it gives us a little bit more, a little extra uh, on top of you know, providing for our families um, because we want to be able to enjoy some pleasures in life, right? Okay, maybe not just a little, okay? A lot of extra. Hopefully, we, because we want to have nice homes, uh, to stay in, maybe a bigger car to drive around in. Uh, and who doesn't want to go on a nice holiday once in a while, right? After all, we work really hard. For many of us, at least maybe for the older ones, we hope that work becomes a career. A career is defined as an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life 
with opportunities for progress. But actually, the term career is a rather new concept, modern. It's built upon this idea that we all have some deep psychological need for self-actualization, right? This Maslow's hierarchy of needs right at the top. Um, so when we stay in a company or a field of work for a period of time, and we get better over the years, we progress through the ranks, it becomes a career. And I hope this message will help us to rethink and to reshape how we think about work. But I'm aware that among us, there are those who are still young, right? Like the ones who led us in the songs today. Uh, the older song leaders are really glad and happy <laughs> <laughs> that we have the young ones willing to come up. And I, I, I think they really did a good job. Amen. Thank you so much. <clears throat> but you're still studying, right? Many of you are still studying, or maybe in NS. Uh, Still, you are constantly bombarded by questions and expectations about what you should do with your future life or your life in future. Questions like, what field should I go into? Um, what should I study to get myself into a position to choose work that I'm passionate about or work that gives me prestige and maybe respect and lots and lots of op opportunity? and along with it, some money, right? A lot of money. A lot of people like you know, work that can give them quite a bit. In some ways, schoolwork is a little bit like work work, although there are obvious differences, like you don't get paid for studying. But hopefully, this message will also help you. Before we delve into the message proper, I, I, I would like to show a video of an artist who uses very unique materials to create his art to tell a message. Oops, is there sound? I forgot to check. Some all the plastics colliding in the oceans these days starting to form a microplastics, which the fish find very easily to ingest. A lot of different fish species, they're eating plastic debris that's found in the ocean no one knows what the effects of it is on our food chain, A, and B, on the existing marine creatures, whether they'll still be there tomorrow. I mean, a lot of turtles die from eating the debris that's our waste, really, that's thrown into the ocean. I love going to the beach with my son and going for walks down the beach and seeing all of the r rubbish on the beach, there's no way I could just leave it. So um, I thought, well, have got to be able to do something with it instead of just throwing it into the landfill. So um, I thought, why not make some marine creatures out of all of this marine debris that I'm picking up? I'll pick up a bag of rubbish and then when I get home, I'll throw it out on the floor and check it all out. Then I'll go and I'll, I'll collect certain pieces that to me look like certain appendages or bits of sea creatures, join all the bits together and um, hopefully create something unique and artistic out of marine debris. Most people are amazed by the resemblance of the sea creatures, the essence that I seem to be able to capture the fact that I'm making something out of nothing, if you will, or you know, using a, a worthless product and then turning it into something of beauty. I, I seem to find a lot of thongs. Thongs are probably the number one thing that I pick up off the beach. Um, usually just one of them, so I don't get to wear them. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think people go for a walk down the beach and they leave their thongs at the you know, at the start of their walk and when they come back because they've had such a great time down the beach, I, I think they just forget to pick their thongs up, you know? And when the tide comes in, they end up in the water or there's ultimate ways that people obviously lose thongs um, because I keep finding them. <laughs> when someone sees one of my pieces, I'm hoping that they will um, identify with that creature, see the plight that it has in the oceans with the marine debris that seems to be increasing these days and that hopefully create awareness 
and everyone can have their own little message out of my piece, see their own story and take away with them what they will, ultimately being the awareness of that sea creature in our environment. All right. Well, I didn't show this video uh, to encourage us to save the ocean or, or you know, save the sea creatures uh, or, or use less plastic, okay? Although this will be quite a worthwhile takeaway too. But I, what, what I really wanted to show is that this artist has an imagination um, that not many of us have. He's able to imagine and visualize how pieces of junk can be assembled into beautiful pieces of art that tell a, a powerful message. To most people, these are just useless pieces of rubbish, right? But he sees potential for beauty and value. And what I want to say is this can also apply to our work. Our work has potential for beauty and power in God's scheme of things. You may see work as utilitarian, right? Practical, you know, it just gives me money, I just want to work. But many of us, we work many hours. Huh? Not yet. <laughs> we work many hours and, 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 and many, you know, very hard all week, every week, all year round. We probably work the most number of hours among uh, many, many countries in the world. So work becomes something of a grind to many of us. And we can't wait to finish work every week. We live for the weekend. For many of us, we have worked like this for years. And we cannot wait for retirement. We just want to be done with work. So even though we spend many hours at work, we disengage from work mentally and emotionally. We have this, this uh, love-hate relationship with work. On the other hand, there are also those of us who swing to the other extreme when we view work as all there is to our lives now. Work takes on way too much significance and it eclipses our perspective on what it means to God. For those of us who work like that, work becomes us. Our whole identity is formed based on our work. So we think of ourselves first as what we work for. We can be educators, or we are healthcare professionals, we're designers, engineers, or there are no doctors among us, but maybe one day there will be. When we, oh, there are Wang. <laughs> How can I forget, right? Well, she's went one of the rare few. Okay. When we think like that, our self worth and our confidence then depends on how well we do at work. When we do well, it goes to our heads. When we don't do so well, it goes into our hearts. We get dejected, and our whole being goes into self doubt and anxiety about performance. Either way, there's a disconnect between how we see work and what it means in our lives as Christians. We've been told that we need to set great examples at our workplaces for the glory of God, but we can't help but be sucked in by the culture of this world. Just as we cannot see the final art pieces that can be crafted from the, from the trash, we also find it very hard to see all the possibilities that present themselves through our work and the value that God really places in work. Perhaps there's this undercurrent that continues to drag us under because we think that labor or work is a consequence of Adam's sin. After all, didn't God say in Genesis 3, cursed is the ground because of you, through painless toil, you will eat food from it all the days. Oh, painful, <laughs> not painless. <laughs> I, I wish it's painless, okay? All the days of your life, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your, of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. From, since from it, you were taken 
for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So, it doesn't help that modern work culture, especially in Singapore, it, it kind of crushes us and drains us emotionally and physically. So it seems like work is a necessary evil that we need to bear with until we return to dust, so to speak. And then our souls will fly to heaven where we live in an eternal holiday, floating around in clouds, <laughs> hopefully doing nothing all day long, right? But is this the true narrative of the Bible? Is work originally designed as a punishment for Adam and we are all cursed to work because we are Adam's descendants. I present to you that this is not the true story. Let's begin. Even before Adam's fall, when God created the world, it says in Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3, after God has created the heavens and the earth, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So the Bible says that work has been there since the beginning. And it's not just work, it's God's work. When God was creating, He sees it as work. Sometimes we think that God doesn't have to put in any real effort, right? Because He's God after all, right? He just has, has to snap His imaginary finger and it's all done. But if you look at the creation that we have all around us, it's so intricate. It's so amazing in all its detail. You know that, how, how can we imagine that this, this doesn't require any, any, any effort, any thought, any energy at all? Because if, if our work is anything to go by, if we, I mean, I'm sure all of us have, have been doing some intricate and, and really complex pieces of work, right? I mean, it takes a lot of energy and time and effort and, and, and thinking that goes into it. If anything to go by, we are all God's image. We're created in God's image, so we, re we reflect the God who made us. Surely, such a mammoth piece of work like creating the world requires effort and energy. Maybe that's not why, maybe that's why God needed to rest after completing the work of art that He has done. Not in a, maybe not in a physical way, but I can imagine the emotional and perhaps spiritual energy, the creative energy that is used in, in such an undertaking. That's also probably why God mandates Sabbath, because He understands that work can be difficult and requires energy and effort from us. Well, Sabbath is another topic for another day, but suffice to say that God rests from His work. He stands back and celebrates the work that he has done and enjoy the fruit of his labor. Also, just before the fall, Genesis chapter 2 also goes on to say that God not only created, he also provided caring for his creation. Two, chapter 2 verse 15 says, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. This was before the fall. So it shows that it has always been God's plan for man to work. When God created the world, He did not create it without any need for further work. There needs to be care put in. Although there's order now that uh, compared to before when it was wild and waste, it was still to a great degree undeveloped. Huge amounts of resources with untapped potential. Man is then to partner with God and be God's instrument in caring for the creation. So work did not come after a golden age of leisure, right? And the Bible scholar sums it up this way. It is perfectly clear that God's good plan always included human beings working, or more specifically, living in a constant cycle of work and rest. In fact, Jesus says, 
in John 5, 17, my father is always at work to this very day. And I too am working. Jesus said this in response to the Pharisees who wanted to stop him from healing during Sabbath, which is amazing because he describes God as a God who is always working. Not in a bad way, I'm sure God rests as well, has his own rest periods. So those of us who are workaholics, don't take this as a, as a um, license to always be working. And Jesus is a, came as a carpenter. He works with his hands. So Tim Keller says in his book, the fact that God put work in paradise is startling to us because we often think, think of work as a, ne- as a necessary evil or even punishment, like I mentioned just now, brought into our human story after the fall of Adam as part of the resulting brokenness and curse. There is some truth in that, you know, but it is not the whole story, like I said. It is work is really a part of the blessedness of the garden of God. Work is as much a basic need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, sexual, sexuality. It is not sim- simply medicine. It is food for our soul. Without meaningful work, we sense significant inner loss and emptiness. So yes, it's, it's probably a little bit like that, that self-actualization in terms of career, except that work is more than that. The end goal is not just the self. Beyond the self, God has got a greater goal, which I will develop as we go along. So let's approach it from another angle. i give you a list of, of uh, jobs, okay, or professions, and you tell me, who does the work of the Lord? Okay, let's, let's raise our hands and vote. You can vote more than once. Okay, who thinks that a missionary and a pastor is doing the work, work of the Lord? Okay, a teacher? I'm a teacher. A bus driver? Business owner? A judge? Okay, I think you get my point. <laughs> so, who, who would you say does the work of the Lord, right? The central verse for today, Colossians 3, 23 to 24. Whatever you do, so you're right. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Many of us know this verse, but I'm not sure whether we have really fully grasped its meaning and its significance and live it through in our daily lives. So who do we really, really, really work for? We can say in a church way, right? Churchy answer, it's Jesus Christ that we work for. But do you really believe this answer? We work for an organization or you get a paycheck from your employer, but who do you really work for? We actually lend our time and our energy to this organization or this company, but our big boss is really Jesus, who calls you to be the most excellent worker in whatever you do. So it's not just pastors and missionaries who work for the Lord. Any kind of work, whatever you do, and like I say, this is probably not new to us, but we, we still do struggle with compartmentalizing our lives into the secular and the spiritual. Our work belongs to secular, and the spiritual part is when we gather on Sundays. Martin Luther, during medieval times, was one of the pioneers of the Reformation movement in the church. It was a time when the church was really very powerful and it dominated the society uh, and it created, the church created a society based on Christianity. And Martin Luther, in his address uh, to nobil- nobility in Germany, he said, It is pure invention that the Pope, bishops, priests, and monks are to be called the spiritual estate, whereas princes, lords, artisans, farmers, 
they are the temporal estate. That is indeed a fine bit of lying and hypocrisy. Yet no one should be frightened by it. And for this reason, that all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate. And there is among them no difference at all, but that of office. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12, we are all one body, yet every member has its work, whereby it serves every other. All because we have one baptism, one gospel, one faith, and all alike, all alike Christians. For baptism, gospel, and faith alone makes us spiritual and a Christian people. So Martin Luther says that there is no difference between work done by a church minister and the work done by everyone else. Everyone's work can be considered spiritual. So whether you are an administrator or your bus driver or your church minister, designer, business owner, or an engineer, we all work for the Lord in whatever that we do. There's no such thing as a job that pleases God more than another job. What is crucial is whether the work is done for the Lord. There may be some church ministers who do not really work for the Lord. They may be working for themselves. On the other hand, there are many grab food deliverers or chefs or IT professionals who really do work for the Lord. Some of us may say, uh, yeah, I really don't differentiate between spiritual and secular, which is good for you. But if we're really honest also, we may want to ask ourselves if we view white-collar work, which is more respectable and prestigious, versus blue-collar, get-your-hands-dirty kind of work that is not. Tim Keller wrote in his book also about a doorman in New York, and I'm sure many of us would have met people like that in your lives. I'm not going to put up the words because it's a long account. I'm just going to read it. Mike is a doorman in New York City. He's one of 15 doormen serving a large Manhattan co-op. His apartment building is home to about 100 homes, 100 families. Now in, in his early 60s, Mike emigrated to the US from Croatia as a young man and worked in many kinds of jobs from the restaurant business to manual labor. He has been a doorman in the building for 20 years and is clearly distinctive in his attitude toward his work. To Mike, it is far from just a job. He cares for the people in the building and he takes pride in helping with loading, finding parking spaces and welcoming guests. He sets the standard for keeping the lobby and the front of the building clean and attractive. When asked about what makes him drop what he's doing to get to the curb in time to help unload a resident's car, after a weekend away, he responds, that's my job, or they really needed help. Why does he remember the name of every child? Because they live here. At one point to the question, why do you work so hard at every part of this job? He replied, I don't know. It's just that I need, it's just what I need to be able to look at myself in the mirror in the morning. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't try my best every day. I don't know about you, but I, when I read this, I really feel a sense of uh, shame when I think about my own attitude at work sometimes. I do take pride in some aspects of my work, but do I try my best in every aspect of my work? There's certainly a lot of room to grow, to put it quite mildly. And I also thought about whether I fully appreciate and respect the dignity and importance of every kind of work, whether it's the bus driver or the security officer in my school or the cleaning auntie at the hawker center. Truth is, if we don't have these so-called blue collar workers keeping our public spaces clean and our society safe, would we be able to do what we do every day? in safety and in peace. And we read just now from Psalms 147, right? Right? Martin Luther has quite an interesting take on some of the verses here. He strengthens the bars of your gates and blesses your people within you. He grants peace 
to your borders and satisfies you with fineness of wheat. So this is really essentially a psalm about God's providence. And in, in these two verses, it says that God keeps the city secure by strengthening the bars of the gates. But if we think carefully, how does God do it? He doesn't, you know, physically come down and do it, right, and protect and stand there at the gates. It's, it's through the border, you know, security officers, right? I mean, in modern words, who keep watch through the day and the night to keep our city safe. How does he grant peace in your borders, to your borders? He gives us good neighbors, right? I mean, relatively good neighbors. We, we should also be good neighbors to our, to our neighborhood, in our neighborhood. How does he satisfy you with the finest of wheat? Through the farmers, right? Who planted and the workers who harvested and the lots and lots of people who pack and, 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 and the list goes on. Martin Luther said, God could have easily given you grain and fruit without your plowing and your planting, but he does not do so. What else is all our work but just a child's performance by which he wants to give his gifts in the fields, at home and everywhere else? These are the masks of God, behind which he wants to remain concealed and do all things. We have a saying, God gives every good thing, but not by waving his hand. God gives all good gifts, but you must lend a hand and take the bull by its horns, meaning we all got to do the work because God will work through us. So make the bars and the gates. Let him fasten them. Labor, but let him give the fruits. Govern and let him give his blessings. Fight and let him give the victory. Preach and let him win hearts. Take a husband and a wife and let him produce the children. Eat and drink and let him nourish and strengthen you. And so on. In all our doings, he is to work through us and he alone shall have the glory from it. So Martin Luther said that we are all the masks of God when our work blesses others around us. So this immediately lifts our work from just providing ourselves for ourselves and our families, though it is still God's calling, or even bringing us some self-actualization, whatever that means, right, to a whole new level. It brings a new layer of meaning to working for the Lord. When we work with all our hearts and through our work serve other people around us, we are working for the Lord because our Lord wants to care for everyone. And through it, our own needs get met we get paid and our families get taken care of. So that's all about what, who we are working for. But Colossians 3, 24 says what we are working for. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. So verse 24 says, talks about what we're working for. We're working for an inheritance, not for an inheritance because we already have the inheritance, but we, we know that we will receive this inheritance from the Lord. So what's this inheritance? In most of Paul's writings, he uses the word inheritance to talk about the future hope of the Christians. So he borrows this term from the Old Testament that talks about the, the story of Israel, right? From, from Egypt, they, they, they were redeemed and then they were brought to a land of milk and honey. To, to their promised land. This is a new home for them to live and to work in a way that honors God. So now the image is also applied to Christians by Paul. That because of this promised inheritance that God is giving us, you know, that there, there must be a connection between what I am doing now on earth to our promised future. If there is no linkage between the two, between what we do now and what we do in the future, then why bother? If our future is some disembodied existence in, in this non-physical space called heaven, where we do nothing except playing harps and float around on clouds, 
But if you think about it, hubs are also physical things, right? So are clouds, even though it's gas. So maybe imaginative hubs and imaginative clouds. But more and more biblical authors are now rethinking this idea that this earth that we're now living in will one day be burned up and destroyed when Jesus comes again. They are now talking instead about a resurrection of the faithful to a renewed earth and a renewed heaven. When God comes down and lives among us, where work and perhaps some aspects of our lives will be transformed. Maybe not in its present form, but work nonetheless. Among them are anti Wright, Tim Keller, Tim Mackey, and many others. Even Douglas Jacobi also wrote a book, uh, What's the Truth About Heaven and Hell, some years ago. He raises some very good questions about traditional belief, about our non-physical souls being transported to heaven one day. So I, I don't have time to talk about um, the details, nor do I have sufficient knowledge, okay, because uh, yeah, I'm still reading and I'm still trying to wrap my mind around some of the arguments and the counter-arguments about these verses because we've been indoctrinated for a long time by this traditional thinking. But there's an interview with N.T. Wright, uh, which, I, which I watch. It's really interesting. It's about his view on the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, you, you watch it and then you, we can discuss, we can talk about it. But from what I've read, they don't even have all the answers. But they have definitely proposed an alternative that really excites me about my future, about our future. More than that, it excites me about what I do now, right? It gives me purpose beyond just earning money to survive or to just fulfill my inner desire for some significance. Because if my future is a transformed earth and a transformed heavens, where life and work will be what God designed it to be, not in a corrupted way, like many things have been corrupted since the fall. When Jesus died on the cross and he put to death all that is corrupted, and when he came back in resurrected form, that became the prototype for what will ha also happen to us. When Jesus was resurrected and the church began, God's people are then supposed to show to the rest of the world how this new world is supposed to be like. What is this really like for God's will to become active and effective in all spheres of life, including work, not just when we gather on Sundays. How I live my life, how I work, how I study, right? Those of you who are students. How relationships within our immediate families and our extended family in church is supposed to be like. All these will take on a new significance. Though not in a perfect way, because we are, we're still in a fallen world, hence this idea of already, but not yet which we have visited a few times in the past weeks. So what Jesus did on the cross, and what we're, we are all, after what Jesus has done on the cross, we're all supposed to be part of it, doing our best to be stewards of this world with all its resources, all of its wholesome activities in the various fields, big and small, businesses, school, hospitals, restaurants, public spaces, our culture, art, music, and theatre. We are all supposed to partner God and His vision by fully participating in it through whatever we are doing. Not by getting by in a detached manner because we are waiting to leave this earth and go somewhere else. And not by leaving the world to neglect since it's going to pass away. And certainly not by going the other way and make and work and end it itself and bury our true identity under it. Whether it is, whatever it is that I'm doing, when I do it with all my heart, I work for the right reasons to participate in God's quest to make this world right and be part of a preview, right, to the new world that will eventually come. I'm going to finish off with another passage from 1 Corinthians 15, which is really mostly about resurrection for the first part of it. But in verse 51, Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, as in die, but we will be all changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, 
the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the, imp when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death will be swallowed up in victory. So Paul was writing to the Christians about the final resurrection because some of them did not believe in it. So he describes what will happen to us when Jesus comes again and all the dead will be resurrected and we'll all be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. I cannot imagine how this will happen, but just reading it really makes my hair stand, just thinking about it. Not in a bad way, but it's going to be amazing. And it's interesting how Paul rounded up the passage about the final resur resurrection with this. Verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So, what is the work of the Lord? It's not just church-related activities, not just mission-related evangelistic work, although we need to be involved, but all work that you and I are involved in every single day. Because there is a future for it, whatever form it may take, and what we do now is not in vain. Thank you.